Hello everyone, and today we're going to be doing things a little bit differently by heading over to Popper to talk about the best Kamigawa cards for that format. We've got Carter here to talk about the top five Kamigawa cards for Popper. Now, Carter, are you excited to talk Popper? I am excited to talk Popper. All right. Now, we're going to cheat a little bit here, and instead of doing top fives, we're going to do really a top six, but, you know, with it's really an honorable mention. So, Carter, why don't you kick us off and talk about your pick for the honorable mention? Okay. Uh, I chose Network Disruptor because I figured another 1-1 one, one flyer in the format in the uh, the set that's getting, giving us another really great ninja. Um, it's probably going to end up being useful. Um, maybe not good enough to replace any of like the fairy cards in, in the predominantly blue decks, like fairies here. But, but maybe, uh, you know, might be an option. Be in decks that don't run you know, fairies for whatever reason and maybe focus more on the ninjas. This has a really nice effect, which can be useful in the late game to help you get blockers through. And obviously it can get across very easily, so you can ninjutsu something in, and then you can pick it up, do it all again. Um, so it seems like it, it could be useful uh, for those reasons. Um, and maybe the fact that it's an artifact can also come into play. Uh, I don't know, but it seems to usually be a good thing in Popper. Yeah, the artifact piece of it is something that I hadn't even thought of. You know, uh, definitely Grixis uh, affinity. You know, is always looking for more artifacts, even if it's an artifact creature. So that'll be interesting to see. Maybe that that's a sideboard option. I wonder if we're going to see more of an aggressive build of the mono blue ninjas or fairies deck, just given that we have so many options and so many ninjas now. Yeah, maybe. Um, you, know, you mentioned that, and it sounds very annoying, so it's probably going to happen. <laughs> <laughs> very true. Well, speaking of ninjas, and I think we both are, you know, itching to talk about the, the what is likely to be, in my opinion, the top deck. Uh, my honorable mention is what I'm assuming is going to be maybe a one or two of in the sideboard of a ninja deck. And it's Moon Snare Specialist. And this is three to ninjutsu. Uh, and you're pretty much always going to be ninjutsuing this. I don't know why you hard cast this, but maybe. Uh, and it bounces a creature up to its owner's hand. And uh, now I've been cheating a little bit. I've actually been playtesting this a little bit with a mono blue ninjas build. And it's pretty fun to bounce, you know, uh, a mirror enforcer back to your opponent's hand as you ninjutsu your spell stutter sprite back to your hand and really hit that tempo play. Don't know if it's good enough though. What do you think about this? Yeah, I'm not sure. Um, I like the idea of it, but I wonder if it's too mana intensive or if the other options, other ninjutsu options are just too appealing because of the, uh, the card advantage. Um, yeah, I don't know well enough. I guess my rule of thumb is that if it costs like, uh, maybe a little bit more mana than you would like. It might not be good enough to be like a tier one staple, but it's just, I guess, because the format is pretty powerful. Yeah, that's a good point. That's a good point. If we compare this to, uh, like, let's say a snap, which doesn't give you the two, two body, but does give you the card draw. And it's, I think it's fairly typically played in mono blue. You know, I, I, it's one less mana, and I think that might make a world of difference. So you make a good point. Well, let's talk about number five. Speaking of card draw, uh, your pick for number five, Carter, take it away. Okay. Uh, Spirited Companion, um, I think, uh, in a way, a lot of people's favorite cards from favorite card from this set. <laughs> the uh, cutest card and the uh, most endearing card. Um, but... I suppose, you know, anything that draws you a card when it comes into play, especially when it's cheap, um, has potential in some way, shape, or form. Um, you can obviously pick this up with something like Core Skyfisher. Mm. You are definitely going to put this in any kind of, like, white flicker deck that you can. Um, I believe there's, like, Familiars decks that might want to play this. I'm not... Well, I'm not too familiar with those. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> A plus pun. <laughs> Thanks. 
And I also um, I've I've heard it heard it said that this could help out um, boggles a lot or boggles. I'm not sure how to pronounce. Oh, interesting. Pronounce that. As a you know another enchantment, so that it will buff whatever's enchanted with like ethereal armor or ancestral mask, and it can eat any edict effects that your opponents throw at you. So, it'd be an option there as well. That is really interesting. I you know immediately when I saw this, I thought of. Uh, the any of the mono white or really guess the, the aggressive white decks like uh, Boros or Soul Siblings, whatever those you know mono white decks that I think tend to run at least a couple copies of uh, Priest of Ancient Lore and Search Party Captain to get some card advantage in a body. But you're right that both Flicker and potentially Vogels would want this type of uh, card just because it's basically an Elvish Visionary White, but also has that enchantment creature tagline. Yeah, and I guess um, it could also see play in Mono White Heroic as well. Mm -hmm. um, if uh use Ethereal Armor. Um, yeah, you'd, I'd like to think that this will show up in, in some way, shape, or form. Well, moving on to my pick for number five. Now, I, I noticed this is a little bit of spoiler alert here. You also had this card on your list, and I think... Uh, for good reason, and we'll we'll talk a little bit about this card here, but I want to save a little bit of the conversation for when we get to your pick. I think this card is almost as good as Deadly Dispute. What's your take on this card versus the Deadly Dispute, which basically does the exact same thing, but instead of gaining you life, it gives you a treasure? You know, when you asked me uh, to send you a list, um, I ended up finding uh, sort of a way to cheat when I had to come up with ways um, with cards that might end up being good in the format. I, I found out like, wait, why don't I just pick cards that are already pretty similar to good cards in Popper? And that helped me put together my list. Um, and obviously this um, is, is definitely like a worse version of Deadly Dispute, but it's still very nice. Um, I think I've heard that uh, Affinity decks sometimes play like costly plunder as sort of like extra copies of Deadly Dispute, mm -hmm. and this is this is better than strictly better than than costly plunder. So, um, as long as there are decks in the format that want to be sacrificing artifacts, then this will definitely some kind of play. I definitely agree with you on that. I feel like this slots right into Grixis Affinity as either copies five or six of Deadly Dispute. So. I'm with you there. I wonder if we're going to see a mono black or maybe like some type of black white uh, affinity build that focuses much more on draining your opponent than it does, you know, beating face with Mer Enforcer. Yeah, I wonder. That would be cool. I've even um, heard with regards to this card that it is like a potential anti burn tech option. Uh... You sack like a air enforcer. Maybe in mono black control, you can sack like a Gurmag Angler and get a bunch of life back. But yeah, not a bad cyborg card against Burn. Yeah. Yeah. I feel like this will probably show up in some way, shape, or form. Yeah. Very powerful and very similar to Deadly Dispute. So. Yeah. All right. Moving on to number four here. I. Uh, now, I love this pick, personally, Carter. So go ahead and, and walk us through Mirror Shell Crab. Well, Mirror Shell Crab has a lot of things going for it, you know? It's um, five generic and two blue, five seven artifact creature crab with uh, ward three and the channel ability, um, two and a blue, discard it, and you counter target spell or ability unless its controller pays three. Um, so... A lot of people have been excited about this because it's the first um, option in Popper to like counter an ability, uh, which you know is a pretty big deal. And not only that, it's attached to like a, a big honking creature that's hard to remove. So <laughs> you've got like uh, a lot of things going on here, um, and all of them pretty good. Yeah, when I saw this card, when you you sent over the list, I had kind of forgotten about it a little bit it, until you had sent it over just going through all the spoilers of Kamigawa the 130 commons or whatever 
that there were that were introduced into the set. Yeah. I um I can't recall the name of the three one flying bird that does kind of the same thing, but I think it's cycling. It, it sees a, a decent amount of play, I think, in historic. Uh, and maybe, you know, at a certain point in time in modern, that does counter target speller ability when you cycle the card. And that, you know, if that's seeing play in historic, that's a powerful effect. Now, this is obviously, unless it's controller pays three, which is not the exact same thing as a hard counter, but can be in a lot of situations. I feel like this is, this is a staple for any type of blue control deck. Now, I don't know if it goes into blue tempo, though. Would, would you ever see this card in a ninjas or fairies deck, do you think, Carter? Um, I feel like Spell Stutter Sprite is, is so good already in decks like those. I they'll probably stick with that. Um, yeah, they, I guess they already got their creature with a counter spell attached, so, so maybe they'd be okay. Um, I've heard it's suggested that this could potentially be good in like the uh, reanimator build, or you know, you counter something with it and then bring it back to from the graveyard. Maybe something like a, a Tron deck with a way to re get it back in your hand, like Pulse of Marasa. And the other thing about the channel ability that people keep bringing up that I always forget is that there's no way to like I guess there's no way to counter it unless your opponent also has a mirror shell crab <laughs> at this point. <laughs> That would be really funny to see. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, you mirroring mirror shell crabs at each other. But, you know, this card is just so unique. Um, I kind of want to see it succeed. I, yeah, I, I, this card seems very, very versatile. And like you said, very unique in the channel aspect of it. I do feel like I am a little bit nervous for those blue-black reanimator decks. You know, I, I played against one. I think it uses... Do they use Exhum? Is that the reanimation spell that they typically use? Yeah, that's the one I see most often. Yeah, that, that seems like a, an oppressive deck to play against, but at, at the very least, I guess they'll kill you quickly with a mirror shell grab. <laughs> yeah, as long as the oppressive decks kill you quickly. <laughs> that's, that's always nice. Yes. <laughs> Better than the alternative. Mm hmm I, I take this over a Stonehorn Dignitary any day. Yeah, exactly. All right, for my number four pick, uh, again, maybe I, I lean a little bit too much into cards that I think would slot into the sideboard as as uh, copies five and six of some cards here, but this seems very similar to another r one red instant in the format in uh, Galvanic Blast, which is obviously just a, a much better version of this. Uh that card is one red, deal two damage to any target. If you have metal craft, it deals four. Whereas this is, you may sacrifice an artifact, and it does to a creature or planeswalker. So you do have to lose an artifact, and it doesn't hit your opponent's face. The upside is, you can play this on turn two, or I guess even one, but you'd probably be sacrificing a great furnace, which you wouldn't want to do, but... You can play this on two and sacrifice your Chromatic Sphere, Chromatic Star. Well, Chromatic Star would probably be the best in that scenario. Get a card out of it and destroy whatever big creature your opponent has. So, um, I wonder. I guess, like we were saying before, when you were talking about Reckoner's Bargain, and we were hypothesizing um, that there might be a, sort of a, a drain um, affinity build with like Disciple of the Vault, sacrificing as much stuff as you can. Um, this would slot in perfectly there. So maybe, maybe Garactos Affinity Drain deck is on the horizon. Um, I'm not sure. All right, so we are back to Reckoner's Bargain for number three. Now, Carter, other than Affinity, are there any other archetypes that you can think of that would want this card in their deck? I feel like you mostly just want to stack your artifacts for value with this, or stack something that'll help you stay alive. Um, otherwise, you'll probably just be running Deadly Dispute. All right. So here's my number three, and hear me out on this one. I know this does not look like much. The reason why I picked this card 
is for the Walls combo deck. Now, typically speaking, I think the build is uh, Axebane Guardian, and then you run Cascade Creatures and uh, not Crash and Ramparts, but there's a, a, a red wall that gives all of your creatures haste. And so basically you have a ton of mana, you Cascade into a bunch of other creatures and you kill your opponent in one shot. Now the alternative is you hit him with a big rolling thunder directly to the face for 20 damage. I think this card is either a one of in the main deck or maybe a, a two of in the sideboard. I don't think this is, you know, a staple in that deck, but it is a three, three. Now defender and reach, uh, there's a lot of defenders that have reach. That's not huge. But being a 3-3 to kill or trade with your opponent's flyers is, I think, going to be a big deal, especially in a format where I think we're going to see a lot more fairies, delvers, that kind of a thing. Carter, am I am I reaching, unintended, <laughs> with this card? I'm not as familiar with those walls decks, so so I don't know. Um, guess if, if they're trying to combo off quickly... Um, maybe they might not have room for something like this that's just in there to like stop some, some flyers from hitting you early on. But I, I don't know. I could be wrong. That is a good point. That the, the I feel like the real big benefit of this is that you either play it on two or you play it on five and destroy, you know, uh, you destroy an insectile aberration. But I suppose in a combo deck, maybe you just don't have the room, even in the sideboard, to slot this in. All right, and with that, Carter, why don't you tell us about your number two pick? Well, this is another card which is just sort of similar to cards that are already good and popper or were already good. Um, the, uh, I don't know, I guess you don't exactly call it card advantage with this, because it doesn't draw you cards. But it kind of does. Anyways, the card advantage that this kind of provides is pretty similar to other artifacts in the format that have been played a lot, like Spare Supplies or Icker Wellspring, um, or in cards that uh, are no longer in the format, like um, Prophetic Prism or Arkham's Astrolabe. So you figure, um, like in uh, a Boros Monarch deck, um, you just want to this up and replay it as many times as you can stuff like a core sky fisher or maybe glint hawk um and then just cast all of your cheap spells off the top of your library um and i believe those decks usually run pretty low to the ground so as long as you're not casting this on turn one you'll probably be able to play whatever you get um and i find that exciting um i like those boros monarch decks so one reason i have this so high is because I think it's a cool option. It's really interesting you you point out Boros Monarchs. As much as I think that this is, you're right, this is a great card for those decks because it does give you, maybe we'll call it conditional card advantage. Yeah. I I was actually thinking of this more for uh, affinity. You know, we, we see Blood Fountain played. And that's a one drop and it really just gives you, uh, what is it, a blood token with it? Yeah. And that's not even card advantage conditionally. I mean, that's card filtering if you pay one and sack the blood token. Now, really, uh, they just use it to sack the, the actual artifacts to uh, you know, deadly dispute, whatever. But I mm -hmm. feel like this, at the floor, it's conditional card advantage. Maybe you play it on turn two and you get a chromatic star off the top of your library and there's another artifact you can throw down your frog might. Uh, and then, you know, the next turn you can get a samurai token that's a 2-2, two -two, which is is kind of a low floor, but sacrificing it to a deadly dispute, and maybe that's good enough with that one drop of card advantage, you know, play this on turn two, play Icker Wellspring on turn three, whatever that play line is. Yeah, I, I mean, it sounds good to me. Um... Like this is continuing our theme of talking about an affinity deck, maybe like black red that is solely focused on sacking stuff and killing your opponent with type of the vault. Um, it would obviously fit really great in there. Yeah. Well, here's the thing, Carter. 
I know I told you this was a top five video, but I lied. This is actually us deck teching our new black red affinity deck. <laughs> <laughs> what? Even I'm surprised. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, just kidding. I, I do, you know, I really do need to pay more attention to Boros Monarch. I feel like that's a deck that is, gets a little bit overshadowed, and I feel like with uh, affinity being taken down a peg, I should stop talking about affinity. And start talking about more aggressive decks that can beat out Affinity. Oh, Affinity still seems to be doing pretty well, so I don't think you're wrong to to focus so much on it. Fair enough. Yeah. Well, with that, I'm going to talk about something other than Affinity now. <laughs> <laughs> so this card again, I feel like I'm I'm reaching with these channel cards, but I just I love the flexibility so much. In the white builds of aggro decks, whether it's Boros, Monarch, uh, Heroics, Soul, Siblings, um, whatever you're running, a one of of this card, I feel like could almost allow you to go down the planes. Now, hear me out on this one. I know that in Soul Siblings, this makes a little bit more sense because if you go down the planes, then you also have that life advantage or the life gain. And then at the top end of the curve, it's, you know, your five drop that's a vigilant uh, creature, which isn't mind-blowing by any means, but for Popper, a 4-4 four four with Vigilance is actually pretty reasonable. And if you just don't have that third plane, so you simply cast this out, you gain life, and you get that third plane so you can play your Celestial, celestial Unicorn. Now, Carter, am I way off base with this one? Five mana feels like a lot to me, but as like a, a top end card, and maybe you only have a couple of them in your deck, coming uh, very useful. And again, uh, being you know pretty versatile, um, like some of the other cards we've talked about. Um, so it's pretty easy to just channel this whenever you need to, be on your opponent's turn, to go grab yourself another land if you get stuck early. I don't think it's unreasonable to imagine it, it could end up as a one or two of in some of the decks you're talking about. It doesn't slot into uh, Rack Dose Affinity, so it just it doesn't exist. <laughs> yeah, that's its biggest flaw. Well, here's the thing, Carter. I know what you're thinking. All of my top picks have, almost all of my top picks have the alternate amazing art. And the answer is, yeah, it probably affected my decisions. <laughs> Don't judge me for that. And you can finally make waifu tribal happen. <laughs> <laughs> so, all right. So I, I changed my mind. This video is no longer Rakdos Affinity Deck Tech. But this is waifu tribal deck tech. <laughs> all right. And and speaking of amazing alternate art, we actually both had this same number one pick here. And it's Moon Circuit Hacker, which is, in my opinion, the almost upgraded version of Ninja the Deep Hours. Carter, why don't you go ahead and uh, tell us a little bit about this card? Yeah, uh, Moon Circuit Hacker is probably every upper player's uh, number one pick for best card from this set. Because it's sort of like Ninja the Deep Hours, uh, but, you know, shifted a little bit. It's kind of like Ninja the Deep Hours' cousin or something. It's uh, It's got its drawback, you know, because it only filters for you after it, it's on the first turn and comes into play. It's it's so much cheaper, you know, both its regular mana value and its ninjutsu cost. Um, and, you know, if you have multiple of these in your deck, it would be very easy just to ninjutsu them in for each other, you know, constantly. So you're always drawing cards with them and not having to discard. I don't know where exactly this fits in like the current tier one decks. I saw some people saying that maybe this would just be like a copy of five of six of Deep Hours, or maybe they thought Deep Hours was still um, so clearly better that they thought that this would maybe be sort of marginal. But obviously a lot of other people, including you, feel differently. Yeah, you know, for me, the, the play lines that I can think of here, turn one Fairy Seer, uh, turn two Ninjutsu, obviously you can Ninjutsu uh, Deep Hours in for two. 
But if you sure. ninjutsu this in for one, you have your mana open for uh, preordain, a brainstorm, a dispel, and a null if you're playing against affinity. I think that hitting your opponent for two and drawing a card, I feel like with with Ninja the Deep Hours and with Moon Circuit Hacker, because they're not evasive, that second hit is a lot less likely, and it's really for that initial hit and card advantage that gets you that tempo swing. And maybe, again, who knows, maybe I'm just getting sucked into this amazing alternate art here, but it it plays like Ninja the Deep Hours one less. No, you're right. The ability to, like, on your second turn, hold up some kind of one-mana spell while ninjutsuing this into play is, like, a, a huge deal. Um, I think that's hard to argue with. I think realistically, if I had to take a step back and say, you know, is Waifu Tribal going to be... No, I'm just kidding. Realistically, <laughs> if I had to take a step back and say, is this going to replace Ninja of the Deep Hours? I think I would probably agree with people who are saying that this is probably copies five and six of Ninja of the Deep Hours, and you just slot out maybe a, a spell or two, do kind of like a 20-20-20 split of creatures, spells, and lands. I know I've seen that type of a build quite a bit with these mono blue tempo decks. I don't mm. know about blue black fairies. Yeah. yeah, I'm not sure. I actually came across the suggestion that in like mono blue tempo decks, maybe you replace Delver with this mm. potentially. It's because if you have something like an even split, like if you were just mentioning, and you're not consistently flipping uh, an instant or sorcery off the top with your delvers, then maybe this is a better option to get you uh, more card advantage. Yeah, that's a that's not a bad idea. I guess people who are are consistently testing and tuning these decks are probably going to tell us in a, in a couple weeks here. So <laughs> yeah, <laughs> we'll find out soon. We will. We will. Let's just hope that uh, blue red scred. And uh, Blue Black Fairies doesn't, you know, dwarf Affinity and become the next Affinity. I, I feel that way. I'm similar, though. Part of me would really love for Spell Stutter Sprite to overstep its bounds and get banned because I hate that card. But <laughs> uh, it would not be good for the format. <laughs> now that would be interesting to see uh, a Spell Stutter Sprite less format. I don't even know what that would look like. Well, Carter. How are you feeling about Kamigawa popper cards overall? Very cool. Very exciting. You know, air shell crab is such a unique effect. Experimental synthesizer um, is, you know, a very unique form of, of card advantage. I like that there ended up being cards from this set that we don't know whether or not they will end up in a huge part of the format, but definitely seem like they could. You know, that's, that's very exciting then instead of it being like either clearly good or clearly worthless. Yes, that is a good point. Uh, having it be more in the middle instead of broken or chaff, that is that is the sweet spot, which I think Kamigawa, Kamigawa really nailed. Thanks for watching, everybody. Like and subscribe, and check out brothersbrawl.tech for more content.